the rationale that is given for these types of law, these laws tends to be not necessarily that teenagers should never see a naked woman or something like that, but that there's something specifically wrong with online porn, the sheer quantity and volume of it. The lawmaker, the, the lawmaker behind uh, Louisiana's age verification ban, which is the one that really got the ball rolling on this uh, to make online porn less accessible, uh, apparently was motivated by an interview that she heard with Billie Eilish, the popular singer that she gave to Howard Stern in 2021 about her personal experiences with online pornography. I'd like to roll that clip and get Ayla's reaction to what she's saying about the effects that she thinks porn had on her. As a woman, I think porn is a disgrace. And I used to watch a lot of porn, to be honest. I started watching porn when I was like 11. I thought that's how you learned how to have sex. I was watching um, abusive porn, to be honest, you know, when I was like 14. And mm. I, you know, thought I was one of the guys and would talk about it and think it was really cool for, for, for not having a problem with it and not seeing why it was bad. And I think it really destroyed my brain. And um, I feel incredibly devastated that I was exposed to so much porn. I think that I had like sleep paralysis and these like almost like night terror slash just nightmares because of it. I think that's how they started because I would just watch abusive BDSM. I couldn't watch anything else like unless it was violent. I like didn't think it was attractive and I had, was a virgin. I, I had never done anything. And and so I, I le it, it led to problems where, you know, the oh, first shit. the first few times I, you know, had sex, I was not saying no to things that were not good and it's because i thought that that's what i was supposed to be attracted to and i just i am i'm so angry that porn is so loved and it's how so many people think that they're supposed to learn it's how so many men think that they're supposed to be and because in porn there's no consent uh, like getting thrown around during sex if you're not interested in being slapped and being choked people are like you're vanilla you're soft you're that's not you're boring in bed and i'm not talking about me i'm talking about women women are like oh i have to like being hurt to be thought of as good in bed what do you think about the experiences she's recounting there that porn just it warps your expectations to uh, of what sexuality could and should be. Uh, I'm like slightly confused by her accounting. Like why, where did she get the idea that being hurt, uh, like the like, abusive porn was the cool porn? Like, was she around a bunch of other like preteens being like, Hey, did you watch this violent BDSM? Like I, I've mm -hmm. I, I, I just I'm legitimately confused. Like maybe it's possible that there's whole cultures out there. Uh, like when I first when she first started talking about, it, I'm like, oh, she's just into it, and then like hasn't come to terms with the fact that she's kinky. But then she said she didn't actually mm. find it attractive. So I'm like, why are you? It, it takes quite a lot of like cultural um, force in some way to like make people regularly watch porn that they're not aroused by. Like, have you ever tried watching porn you're not aroused by? Like ever? Right. Right. Uh, how much uh, sure. have you done that? Right. Like, uh, so this is why I'm just confused. Again, I'm not saying that like that she's like incorrect or something. I'm just I noticed that something's not adding up here. Um, yeah. But, and, I mean, I know you have written about the about violent porn and, you know, she, the way the way she's laying it out there is the is it's like it makes men want to engage in really rough, violent sex. And then women feel like they have to like that, too. Your your writing on this uh, and your, your research seems to show that it's actually women who have a preference for more violent pornography. Could you? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, like to, to pump our intuition here, you look at women's romance novels. Um, there's a lot of like pretty aggressive men who are not that interested in consent, uh, and this is like written by women for women. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey, almost popular selling women's novel, 
Uh, and I don't think that it's because women are desperately trying to please men so that they go and make this novel so popular that like most men don't give a shit about. Um, and basically every, yeah, like that, the, the thing that you pulled up, um, I, I did a survey where I asked people, partially my audience and partially people I paid who are random, have no association with me. Um, and I asked like men what to predict what they thought that women would like in bed. Like, hey, let's say you try. Oh, wait, actually, oh, this might be a different. I forget. Mm. I wrote a couple different blog posts, so I get them mixed up. But well, I've, got, I've, I've got a couple of your graphs here that maybe we could talk about that will be a way to talk about it. The, this is the one where you asked, how often do you read or watch erotic content for the purposes of arousal? And it shows that overall, unsurprisingly, cis men watch and read more erotic content than women. But then you ask how much of the porn you watch is violent. Um, cis men, there's, uh, you know, uh, over 30% said none. For women, that number is lower, 25%. So it's the, you know, the absolute number of men watching porn, unsurprisingly, is higher. But of the women who do watch porn, they are more likely than men to watch violent. Yeah. Porn. And like the theory no. where it's like, oh, a pressure from men is causing women to want, like maybe you could be like, oh, women are reporting that they like violent porn because they're trying to please men. But like, let's say we're in a world where we have like, say, 40% of men really like violent porn. And like, in, in truth, only 10% of women do. And then we have mm -hmm. a bunch of cultural pressure from the men, like, oh, more women should like violent porn. Um, I wouldn't expect the number of women that like violent porn to get shot up that that degree. Like I, maybe I would see some inflation, like, oh, now it's like 15% or 20% of women are reporting it. But like the fact that now more women than men are reporting interest in violent porn, like that just doesn't seem to be really consistent with this theory. Yeah, I, I want to get uh, a little bit, a few more of your your findings on human sexuality because mm -hmm. the, the you know you you have these huge samples like how do you remember off the top of your head about how big that uh, your your survey was where you're drawing this data it's, from? It's still coming in uh, now. It's six hundred twenty-two thousand cleaned. Okay, but more than that uncleaned, depending on how you clean it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's a huge sample. And I was looking through some of it, some of your results in preparing for this. One was this, uh, what women say they like versus what men predict women will like, because it's, you know, the, the idea that Billie Eilish is putting forth in that clip is that porn sort of warps men's brains to make them think women want different things than they actually want. Uh, but if you look here, I mean, it's like the 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 most popular answer on both sides, you know, like call her beautiful and sexy, kissing, cunnilingus, missionary with legs up. Like it's matching almost. It's not a perfect match, but it's it's pretty close. Um, I mean, was that were those kind of results at all surprising to you or what it what do you make from that data? I mean, the fact that they're close isn't like overall close is not that surprising. I try to have like a broad spectrum from like extremely vanilla and like everybody likes it to like extremely bad and like very few people yeah. don't like it. So given yeah, like the, the lowest thing, one here is like, uh, like tell her she's uh, call her ugly or like <laughs> shove her head in a toilet. Uh, and both sexes agree that that's not, uh, that's not sexy. <laughs> you rims you. That's another one that is just, yeah. you know, not quite catching on just yet. Mm -hmm. No. Um, but but so yeah, there's the, there doesn't seem to be there don't seem to be a lot of men answering that you know you should sh that they think shoving a woman's head in a toilet or like pissing on her face is the best way. I actually way asked to, that one because once be a guy shoved yeah. my head into a toilet and I was like, huh, wow, it was interesting. <laughs> I don't think it's you know, my thing, but like I'm glad to have experienced it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Wait, you know, like touching the water or like how far in did your head? Go? No, very close to the water. I thought that I thought wow. he was going to show it. <laughs> Would that have changed your appreciation of it, of the experience? I don't think so. I think I mean, I, I, I would prefer not having my head shoved in any more toilets. Uh, yeah. But I like it, it's just I don't know. It's like interesting to go through that experience because like yeah. when do you ever get the opportunity to have your head shoved in a toilet? Uh, very infrequently in my yeah. daily life, Un unfortunately, no. apparently. Uh, sorry, I'm a journalist, so I have to ask the important follow-up questions. Yeah. Like, uh, thanks for thanks for digging into that one. Uh, it, you oh. know, it's like a, a problem 
that we run into often in 2023 America is like anytime there's a potential downside or harm to some product, whether that's porn or drugs, there's like almost an assumption that therefore state prohibition or at least regulation is mm -hmm. the remedy. And I think all of us in this conversation reject that notion. None of us are for banning porn, even if some of us think kids shouldn't have you know, unmitigated access to it, or that porn might be bad for some people. I think, though, that if we want to move towards a freer society where we leave more responsibility with individuals to moderate themselves instead of relying on the state to nanny us, it's going to require honest discussion about downsides or pitfalls. We don't have to like something or celebrate everything to tolerate it. And I just want to give that preface before we talk about a little bit more about some of the major criticisms of the online porn industry, um, many of which were raised in this article for Skeptic Magazine called How Porn is Messing with Your Manhood, which was authored by three writers who have written full books on what they see as the, the scourge or the downsides of online porn. And I just want to bring up a couple of these with you, Ayla, because they're criticisms you hear commonly. And I want to know if you think there's much to them. Um, and if so, if there's anything that can be done realistically to mitigate this other than trying to implement a, a porn ban that certainly won't work. Um, one, of this, uh, one of these ideas is what the author calls sexual anorexia. And he bases a lot of this argument off an Italian uh, survey that found that, um, you know, by sexual anorexia, he means difficulty having sex with a real partner. So the researcher, Professor Carlo Foresta, explained that the problem worsens when young men's sexuality develops independently from real life sexual relationships. He said viewers who watched a lot of porn, especially if they started early, 14 years old, um, became less responsive first to the porn itself, and then their libido dropped, and finally it becomes difficult to get an erection. And there is some you know, wider empirical data showing the rise of uh, erectile dysfunction among younger men worldwide and in, in America as well. We can't directly link that to porn, but it's a phenomenon. Um, but what do you, is that something you've observed or have any, uh, anything to say about the, the idea that men can become reliant on porn for sexual release and then don't know what to do in a real life situation with a woman? Yeah. I, there's some, some like a uh, professor friends I have that say that like sex porn addiction isn't a real thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I am not sure that I find that convincing. You just need to find like one person who like a good introspection who reports like, hey, I f feel like this is damaging my life. And you can get addicted to so many things. It just feels weird to be like, you can't just to put like a pin in one end of it. But on the other end, it's like difficult for me to under to like trust a lot of the research on this because it's so motivated in both directions. People are really personally offended by pornography. And there's also um, the, there's a lot of uh, incentive for self-insight to, to go awry here. Like, um, like if you are, say, for example, having erectile dysfunction problems for other reasons, like that might be health related, um, it might be very easy for you to try to find a causal thing that uh, that you're aware of like oh maybe it's the porn that's doing it we see this with fetishes all the time a lot of my data doesn't support that childhood experiences correlate with fetishes and yet we mm. constantly have narratives like oh i think i'm into this thing because you know i was spanked as a child or i wasn't spanked as a child or something um so i just am like very up close and personal all the time to the way that we can like make stories connect with our lives in ways that turn out to be completely fake um, yeah. And I'm not saying that they're always fake. I'm just saying that like when I'm reading people making like causal claims about this, it's just something you have to be super, super careful about. We have to really, I have to pick through the study um, and like try looking at different questions to try and coordinate, like triangulate what the answer might be. Um, I think a lot of the discussion around porn addiction 
um, is misguided for this reason. I, I would be surprised if it were all true. But again, I would be surprised if none of it were true. I would, so my guess is that porn addiction is like yeah. a legitimate problem where it is fucking some people up. But my guess is it's a smaller number of people than a lot of this discourse currently is claiming. Yeah. On, on the issue of fetishes, that was another topic that they raised in this article that because on these porn sites, you can effortlessly click from scene to scene and genre and genre to genre to boost your arousal. It's like you've put yourself in a Skinner box. Like the change means that you can just condition, they say condition your arousal patterns to an ongoing, escalating and ever-changing novelty. So thus users are conditioning their sexual arousal template to everything associated with their porn use their brains then expect these things during sexual arousal, yet none of these attributes of online porn match sex with a real person who cannot compete with the buffet provided by porn. So the argument boils down to it's giving you porn brain. Um, you get sucked down these very specific fetish rabbit holes. Um, is there anything to that? Uh, have you observed that either in your survey data or, no. you know, dealing with real life clients? Th this is the thing I'm much more sus about. Like the other things, like maybe porn ruins your life, maybe. But this, I'm like, I just, it feels so much more skeptical. Like, uh, in my theory currently, which take it with a grain of salt, I may come back and be like, actually, I've updated this based on more data. But currently, my theory is that there's like kind of two categories of uh, like ways that you can have a fetish. And one is that it has early onset and it is quite strong. So like mm -hmm. you, you typically people in this category remember their fetish is happening, like some of their earliest memories, just like an intense fascination with this thing. And now this thing as an adult is quite central to their sexuality. And then secondarily, you have uh, late, like late onset, and this is due to some kind of conditioning, and it's usually much milder. So this is kind of like guy whose girlfriend puts her hair up in a ponytail every time she gives him a blowjob, and now he's out and he like, sees a girl put her hair in a ponytail at a grocery store and he like gets a chub. Like that's what I would consider to be like conditioned sexuality. Um, and but usually they're not uh, like fetishes in the classic sense that we think of that term. Like they're not super strong. Um, but you, I think the way most fetishistic sexuality works is very similar to sexual orientation. Some people uh, like latch onto feet. Some people latch onto like being gay. Honestly, I think latching onto being straight is like the default one. I don't think that these are meaningfully different. Um, but uh, and we know how well gay conversion camps work. We know what happens when we try extremely hard to recondition people's sexuality um, in the terms of orientation. Uh, it's basically incredibly ineffective. And so like, this is why I have quite a bit of doubt when it comes to reconditioning like deep sexuality uh, in other regards. Like if you can't make somebody attracted with, from penises to vaginas, like you're not going to be able to make somebody become that level of attracted to like feet or bondage or something you can do like the conditioning thing like your girlfriend puts her hair up in a ponytail but there's no way you can change a fetish on the level of like this happened early and it is deeply central to my sexuality no way hey thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with ayla about porn laws the sexual revolution and the freedom to browse the internet privately and speak anonymously you can watch another clip right here or the full conversation over here